Hit one other button here. Yeah, as I was saying, I'm Paul Gannett, and I am Product Marketing Manager for Onset's Environmental Monitoring Products. There are going to be two parts to today's webinar. First, I will talk a little about our new Hobo U20L water level loggers, and then I will share with you some tips on deploying water level loggers in general. These tips are intended to help you save time and ensure that you get good quality data. So just in terms of our, uh, the topics that I hope to cover today is uh, first I'm going to just give you a brief introduction to Onset for those of you who are not familiar with us. And then I'm going to introduce the uh, U20L water level loggers, uh, give you a brief overview, compare them to our other uh, U20 water level loggers, and then give you a chance to ask some questions on those. And then I'm going to get into uh, the deployment uh, tips section of the, the webinar where I'll talk about mounting methods, uh, preparing for deployment, uh, some field deployment uh, uh, tips, and then a little bit about uh, some of the features in our software that uh, you may or may not know about that can help uh, uh, speed uh, your deployment. And then I'll, I'll have some more time for questions and answers. So just a few details about the uh, webinar. It's going to last for about an hour, uh, including time for questions. Uh, if you have questions, please type them into the questions section on your GoToWebinar control panel. I will address some questions as we go, but I'll probably save most of them for the end of each segment. If I don't get to every question during the webinar, we will follow up with you after the presentation. I am recording the webinar today, and you will receive a follow-up email within a few days with a link to the recording. This way, you can review the webinar at your convenience and share it with uh, your colleagues. Uh, we are always looking for ways to improve our webinars, so please give us your feedback at the end of the webinar. When the webinar closes, a short evaluation survey will pop up on your screen, and we would appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts. This just repeats. Okay, just a little bit about onset. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know us, we are... Um, are the makers of the Hobo data loggers. We've been making them since 1981 here in Massachusetts on Cape Cod, uh, where we design and build all of our products. Our logging solutions are used all over the world for monitoring environmental conditions and building performance. And we have a global network of dealers to provide support wherever you may be. So that's it for the introduction on, uh, on uh, onset. So let me switch gears to the uh, U20L uh, water level loggers. And before I actually get into the loggers, I just want to have a little sense for uh, where you are coming from. So I want to ask a question. So let me see if I can get this to work. I'm going to launch this. And um, the question is, is what data loggers have you been using? And if you could check off the box on your screen to indicate which ones uh, you're using or if you haven't been using them. And uh, I'll let this run for uh, about 40 seconds or so, give you a chance to consider. I can see you're answering, so that's good, good. Looks like we got uh, answers in all the categories. Good cross-section of attendees, we like that. Looks like most of you have had a chance to answer, so let me, yep, I think we got everybody. Let me close this out, and let me share with you uh, the results from this. And as you can see from this, uh, you know, about half of you are already using Hobo Water Level Logger, so a lot of this will be familiar to you uh, in terms of the, the especially the, the new logger, it will be, uh, look very familiar. And uh, let's see, we've got others that have been using other Hobo loggers. 36% uh, have been using uh, other vendors' water level loggers. So we'll, we'll, you'll get a chance to see what's different about the Hobo water level loggers. And 22% um, uh, other loggers and 15% uh, are, uh, are new. So hopefully we'll get you excited about using data loggers here. So let's, uh, that gives me a sense. Let's let me continue on. So. Yeah, here's the U20L water level logger. This is what it uh, looks like. 
And let me tell you a little bit about it. It uh, features a durable polypropylene housing uh, to achieve a $299 price. We're very excited about being able to offer a water level logger at that price. And uh, being made out of poly polypropylene, it can be used in fresh or salt water. And uh, functionally, uh, for those of you who have been using our other water level loggers, it operates basically exactly the same. There's a few differences, and we'll talk about those, but functionally it operates the same. And there is three ranges available, a 13-foot range, a 30-foot range, and a 100-foot range. And just to kind of summarize uh, uh, what uh, are some of the key advantages, first off, of course, is the price, and that will allow you to get more spatial coverage for a given budget. Or if your budgets have been shrinking, which happens in a lot of places these days, uh, this makes them more affordable. It's uh, got a durable uh, polypropylene housing, which means it can be used in both fresh and salt water. And it is part of the Hobo Water Logger family, and it is compatible with the Hobo Waterproof Shuttle and the HoboWare Pro software. Uh, and that, some of the advantages of that, which you're, if you've been using our loggers, you're familiar with. It's got the optic data offload for easy and reliable offload in the field. Uh, you got the convenience of using the data shuttle to offload in the field. And the HopeAware Pro software does the conversion to water level, and, and it also provides uh, a nice environment for analyzing the data afterwards. So this slide's a little bit busy. I apologize uh, for that, but let me go through it. Um, and let's see, in terms of the uh, – basically, this is going to compare the U20L series over in this column to the U20 series, our, uh, our metal, uh, titanium, and stainless steel loggers over in this column. Uh, and, and both of them, uh, you know, uh, offer uh, advantages. So we'll kind of give you a, a chance to compare, uh, compare them. So first off, in terms of price, uh, the U20L, of course, features its $299 price, which we're very excited about. The uh, stainless steel U20 logger sell for $495, and the titaniums sell for $595. And that's still a, a, a great price for that kind of accuracy. And speaking of accuracy, the uh, U20L series is slightly less accurate at 0.1% versus 0.05% or 0.075% for the 13-foot model. Uh, and both of the loggers feature uh, excellent uh, temperature compensating. Uh, compensation if you're in waters where the temperatures are changing. The uh, the diameter of the U20L series is slightly larger, uh, a little over a quarter of an inch larger than the U20 uh, series loggers. Uh, the response time, uh, the th that's a temperature response time. The pressure response time is almost instantaneous, but the temperature response time is what the difference is. Uh, it's, it is slower for the U20L series because of the, um, uh, the thermal properties of polypropylene. Uh, but uh, in our testing, uh, the polypropylene uh, response time is still plenty fast enough to keep up with the temperature changes in most natural uh, waters. Uh, but if you really need that fast temperature response time, uh, uh, you may want to still look at the, the metal stainless steel loggers. In terms of durability, the uh, U20L series uh, has a very durable polypropylene housing. Um, and again, that's that's really durable for most uh, environments. Oh, I should mention too that both of them use the same ceramic sensor. Uh, you know, but of course, for the highest durability, especially if you're in near freezing conditions or you, you might be ice uh, present, in that case, uh, the metal housing still provide the the highest durability in those conditions. In terms of shielding, the uh, U20L series uh, meets the CE requirements for IRFI immunity, uh, as does the uh, U20 series. Uh, the, the metal housing does provide a little bit of extra shielding uh, if you're in a, in a especially ESD-prone uh, environment, such as if there's uh, a lot of lightning in the area. Uh, in terms of depth ranges, the uh, U20L series is rated as models rated up to 100 foot uh, of depth range, uh, and, and there's there's over uh, pressure beyond that, but that's the, the 100 feet is the calibrated range, and the um, U20L series has models up to 250 feet uh, of depth. In terms of saltwater use, uh, the, of course, the U20L uh, series can be used in either uh, freshwater or saltwater because the polypropylene really doesn't uh, get bothered by that. 
uh, for our U20 loggers, we would recommend the titanium uh, housing for uh, any saltwater deployments. And uh, in terms of uh, NIST calibration certificates, uh, the U20L series does not include a, a calibration certificate, whereas the U20 series does include a three-point NIST traceable uh, certificate. And let's see. Here's a here's a question I'm going to jump over to now in the question section, and uh, it it is does the U20L float or sink in water? And um, it it does. Uh, uh, sink. We've actually added weights inside the housing to uh, to ensure that it sinks, you know, soundly. And it, and if you were to, uh, unfortunately, I don't have one I can hand you. But if I were to give you one, you'd, you'd feel it's got a nice heft to it. It's a, it's a very solid feeling logger. So yeah, it does sink, and you don't have to add any additional weights to get it to sink. Let's see. And just a couple of other features about the U20L. It's uh, Self-contained, uh, no vent tubes to worry about, which makes it really uh, easy to deploy, just you know, like our other water level loggers. And it uses the same durable ceramic sensor that is suitable for salt water, and uh, it's it's rugged enough that it can actually withstand being frozen. And as soon as it unfreezes, uh, it is, still has its uh, its calibration. It's a very durable sensor. Let's see. So um, here's a chance to ask questions specifically on the U20L loggers. And it uh, looks like we've got a few questions here. Um, yeah, so let me jump right on into them. Uh, and uh, the first one is, for surface water monitoring, is it generally preferable to try to mount the U20L in a stilling well, as you would for other types of water level recorders? And, uh, yeah, I would generally uh, recommend putting it in a stilling well. And uh, we'll actually see many examples of uh, uh, stilling wells uh, for various situations as part of the, uh, this, you know, the second part of uh, today's webinar. So, uh, but, yeah, I would definitely recommend that uh, for the U20L, the, the same as for our U20 loggers. Let's see. Let's see, what is the accuracy of the 13-foot model, uh, the U20L? And uh, the accuracy is 0.1%, uh, uh, which is, if you look at it in feet, I think that's, uh, uh, well, that would be uh, 0.13, uh, you know, 0.013 feet. Sorry, I slipped a digit there. You know, just, uh, yeah, so 0 0.1 times... Uh, 100 feet or 0.1% times uh, uh, 13 feet would be uh, 0.01 foot of, of accuracy. So it does, doesn't quite meet that, um, you know, so I know some cases you like to have that 0.01 foot accuracy. It doesn't quite achieve that, but it's close. Um, let's see, how large is the memory? Well, yeah, that's a good question. It's the same as our existing U20 uh, loggers, which is about 20,000 sets of readings. And... Let's see, I'm getting lots of questions here. Uh, the battery life is, uh, uh, it's the same as our uh, our U20 loggers, which I believe it's a five-year battery life that we rate these for. It's, it's either five or six, that, that'll be in the, the specs on the web, but it's uh, it's got a good battery life, and we spec our battery lives at a one-minute logging rate, so at a one-minute logging rate, it'll last five or six years. Let's see. Yeah. Um, another question on battery life. The battery replacement cost. There's a question about the battery replacement cost. It, this does have a, um, a factory replaceable battery, so you need to send it back to us, and we will replace the battery, do, do a, a tune-up service to make sure that it's still um, uh, calibrated. And that will be, it's uh, basically 40% of the cost, so that would be $120 uh, for the battery replacement service. And But when you get it back, it's basically just like a brand new logger. It's a discuss barometric corrected data loggers versus others. We're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the, um, I'll show you the barometric pressure uh, assistant, so you get a sense for what the process is for 
using a, uh, a barometric pressure logger in conjunction with a, a downhole logger, uh, uh, you know, the U20 in the water. So. Uh, let's see. Oh, we got a good input here uh, uh, about uh, providing uh, a program to convert recorded levels to a volume using a configured weir or flume, and that's something we don't have. But I think a lot of that exists out there. But that's a, that's not a bad idea to integrate in. I like that. So keep the good ideas coming. Let's see. Yeah, it's a good good question. When using the U20L with a set of older Hobo water level loggers, what are some things we should consider when comparing the data? Uh, we currently have five water level loggers and need to add another one. Would this different model present problems for comparing the data? The um, yeah, my my sense is probably uh, that would be fine. The only uh, situation where I would think that it might not be is if you've got waters that are changing. Uh, fairly quickly in terms of their temperature, the uh, uh, because the response time is a little different, you might see some lag in the uh, the calibration. So, especially if it's just one more logger, then in, in that case, I might just get another one of what you have. But if the water temperatures you know are relatively stable, they're not changing more than five degrees C a day or something like that, then then you're probably uh, fine mixing and matching the loggers. The data uh, will look the same in our software, and uh, and you can you know put them through the same barometric compensation assistant, and you know everything's pretty much the same. Let's see. Okay. Uh, what's the downside of not having a, a certificate of calibration? Um, really, you know, I, my sense is that most folks don't actually need that uh, certificate of calibration. We do um, provide those for uh, for cases where you need that traceability. Uh, we provide that uh, kind of proof that our, of our accuracy versus a, a NIST traceable uh, pressure standard. But in fact, we do test all of our loggers, both our new ones, our U20L series loggers and the uh, the regular U20 series loggers against uh, the, you know, a NIST traceable standard. So we're, that's part of our, our calibration process. So, uh, you know, within, you know, uh, that, you know, that typical accuracy spec we give, uh, you know, the, you know, the performance should be very comparable. So if you, if, 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 if you don't have management asking you for those NIST traceable certificates, then you probably don't need those. There's a question here about, can you use the same waterproof shuttle with a different coupler? Uh, with the U20L logger, and, and the answer to that is yes, the, the same waterproof shuttle works. You just have to use the uh, coupler that's used with our water temperature, our water temp pros, and our conductivity loggers, and our DO loggers. So it's um, as long as you've got that uh, U22 coupler, uh, you can use that with the U20L logger. And that was, you know, that's one of the couplers that's been included with our base station and our, and our waterproof shuttles. Let's see. Oh, here's a question. Does the casing of the U20L absorb any potential groundwater contaminants, uh, e.g. Uh, VOCs? Would it be suitable for an acidic environment, uh, acid mine uh, drainage sites? And let's see. Um, yeah, um, and basically the metal in the U20L uh, water level loggers uh, have the same limitations. Both are suitable for waters containing contaminants with most fuels, solvents, and lubricants. Uh, on the other hand, both are not suitable for use in polar solvents such as acetone, ketone, ammonia, and brake fluids. Uh, if in doubt, uh, we do specify all the, the wetted materials in, in bo for both of our series of loggers. You can check the materials compatibility uh, with uh, you know the solvents that are, are present in your waters, just to be safe. But uh, uh, acids, and in terms of acids, I'm not sure on acids, so that's something where you might want to check with the uh, materials compatibility. So yeah, okay. It was a question about. Uh, I mentioned that the ceramic sensor could be frozen and come out uh, back with inspects. Uh, what about the housing? Yeah, the housing uh, again, uh, uh, it can be frozen, and uh, you know when it thaws out, uh, 
it'll still meet its calibration. It's a, it's a, I should mention that the, uh, the housing material that we used uh, for the U20L series loggers, it's the same polypropylene that we've been using on our U22 loggers, uh, which we've been selling for five, six years, and those have proven to be very durable in a wide range uh, uh, of environments. So uh, we're very, we feel very good about this material for, uh, uh, for these water level loggers. And you know what I'm going to do? There's actually some more questions here. Oh, oh boy, I'm, I'm excited to see all these good questions. And but I want to make sure I have time to get to some of the deployment tips. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of set these questions aside, and um, maybe I'll get to some of them at the end of the webinar, and maybe some of them I'll have to just follow uh, up with you afterwards. And we'll, we'll make sure that we get answers to you uh, on, on all of these questions. So, uh, yeah, it's great to see these questions. So let's come back here, and we'll talk a little bit about deployment tips. So uh, yeah, so there's a little different uh, uh, different angle, but uh, for a lot of you, uh, hopefully this will provide some some uh, good good ways to save some time and uh, get more reliable data. But first, I want to again ask you another question, and let me pull this one up. And the question here is, where do you plan to deploy water level loggers? And this is just to give me a sense for what kind of environments. Uh, you're uh, you're thinking of, and that uh, that'll affect uh, some of the you know what the deployment uh, techniques that I talk about. So let's see. Okay, good cross section here as well. We'll give this about about the same amount of time, 40 seconds or so, so everybody gets a chance to answer, and uh, you can answer. Uh, you know, you can have multiple answers because I know a lot of you are you know kind of got multiple applications. Looks like streams and rivers is our, uh, oh, oh, we just got, uh, we got a write-in candidate for wetlands. Uh, yep, that's uh, one I don't have here. That's a good good point. But uh, uh, streams and, so I apologize for that. Uh, streams and rivers seems to be the uh, winner. So let me uh, let me show you the results. So 64% are deploying in streams and rivers, followed by groundwater monitoring wells. I guess they, oh, there's another vote for wetlands too. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so a good good mix there, ponds and lakes. Not so much in oceans and bays. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's kind of what I expected, and a, and a fair number in estuaries as well. So uh, oh, lots of uh, uh, write-in uh, votes. Uh, so thanks for sending those in. Uh, irrigation ditches as well, so uh, good, love it. So, so thanks, uh, thanks for that. Let's see. come back here. So, yeah, let's talk about mounting now, and uh, that's that's kind of the first uh, first thing you want to be thinking about because proper mounting is key for getting accurate water level data. And it requires a certain amount of planning ahead, uh, so there's time to explore options and make sure you've got everything you need before you get out in the field. And just some general things to keep in mind as you're considering your deployment. Uh, you want to make sure that the logger is not moving during deployment, especially you don't want it moving up and down. A little bit of side-to-side -side movement may be okay. Uh, uh, you want to plan for getting the data off because these loggers, in order to offload the data, you actually have to pull them up so you can plug them into our uh, our shuttle or our base station to offload the data. So think about that. And uh, you also want to uh, include appropriate uh, protection measures to prevent against fouling. A lot of environments, that's a, that's a real issue. Uh, you might need some silt screens or uh, make sure the loggers uh, mounted high enough so that it's not into the the silt at the bottom of a well, for example. Um, yeah, so uh, be thinking about that. And here's just uh, a, a typical cross section, and I'm going to actually talk about each of these areas in more detail in the following slides. But uh, of course, wells, uh, as we saw from the, the survey, real common. Uh, mounting them on some, some sort of post is another common uh, deployment. Uh, attaching uh, like a concrete block or a rock, you know, on the bottom of, of a of a river. Uh, those are those are all common mounting techniques. So let's take a look at each one of those. First, 
uh, mounting wealth. Uh, where did that come up? Second most common. <laughs> and, and even if you're putting it in a stilling well, that's really just kind of another variation on a mounting well. So this, this applies in that case as well. And uh, typically you want to uh, uh, have a couple of loggers, one that's down in the water, as I show down here at the bottom, the water level logger. And then somewhere on site you'll want to have a, a, a barometric pressure logger. To, uh, to be recording the barometric pressure in the area. And you only need one of those for an area, and then you can take the data from that and use that in our software later on to compensate for barometric pressure changes, which is important. Um, so mounting in wells. Uh, use a, a stainless steel wire that will not stretch or kink. Uh, typically, 3 sixteenths of an inch uh, uh, stainless steel aircraft cable uh, is used. If it's going to be in an environment where you need to be cleaning it off, especially if you've got contaminants in there, you probably want to use a Teflon coated wire that uh, is uh, easier to clean. And uh, in terms of places where you can get uh, suspension wire, you can get it from us. Uh, if you're buying it in bulk, you might want to go to some other uh, you know, bulk supplier such as webriggingsupply.com. And um, if you're in most cases, you want to make sure that the well is vented to the atmosphere. Uh, that's assuming that uh, you're going to be uh, adjusting the data with one barometric pressure logger you know, across multiple wells. You want to have them all uh, vented to the atmosphere. And talking about building a stilling well, a lot of times you don't have a well there already, uh, or if it's in a stream or uh, uh, a river, or a lake, you might want to have a stilling well go uh, to to protect the well or to protect to protect the water level logger. Sorry, uh, PVC pipe, uh, the most common uh, material, easy to work with, uh, pretty inexpensive. Metal pipes are also used quite often, and um, it's okay for the stilling well to be sloped if you want it to go along the bank of the stream or or river. Um, you just got to make sure there's enough slope to it that the logger won't get stuck. Uh, and you also need to make sure there's a way to get a reference water level reading. Uh, so here's just some pictures of some uh, typical stilling wells. Uh, here's, uh, if you've got a structure there, uh, such as a dock, you, you might want to attach a stilling well to the dock. And uh, as long as it's uh, you know a solid dock, that will give you a nice place to you know to mount a water level logger. Could be uh, attached to a bridge abutment, uh, uh, attached to a rock. You know, it gets a little tricky attaching to rocks, but there's ways of doing that. Um, quite often, you'll want to have a, a a gauge like this nearby. There's a couple different gauge types. This one's built right onto the stilling well, which I thought was kind of clever. Uh, and this will give you your, uh, your reference readings, uh, which your water level readings will be referenced against. And down here is a stilling well that goes uh, at an angle, just kind of to show you how you can uh, uh, use a stilling well like this as well. Uh, and that, the nice thing about that is it gets it out of the way of any uh, boat traffic uh, uh, on the stream. And a little bit more about stilling wells. Uh, first off, I show a picture here of a slotted PVC pipe. That's a very common uh, uh, piping to use for uh, stilling wells. It uh, keeps the uh, the silt and the dirt and the stones out of the the well while allowing the water in. And you just got to make sure your your uh, slots are fine enough so that it doesn't uh, allow stuff into the well. Sometimes you can put a point you know you put a point on here to drive it in, or sometimes you can just drive it directly into the ground if it's soft enough. Uh, and make sure the pipe has holes in it so that the water is getting uh, into it and that the holes don't get clogged. And you got to make sure that those holes are low enough to include the uh, lowest water levels that you might experience. And use something uh, such as a screen or a slotted PVC pipe to keep the uh, uh, silt out. And uh, here's uh, one way of putting a, a stilling well in, which is to put in a um, piece of rebar where you just pound it into the bottom, and then you, on the top side, you put in a bolt to hold the, the rebar in place on top, and then you can see the um, stilling well down here in the water. I thought this was a, a clever deployment technique. And, and here you, you can either drill uh, a hole in the rock with a rotary hammer drill, 
or perhaps use uh, uh, devices like climbers use to, to fasten the, the top. The advantage of those is they might be a little bit faster, but or sometimes you need a mix of uh, mounting methods. But, um, so uh, here's a, a kind of what I generally call mounting on a stake. Uh, in this picture, you can see uh, just a, a fence post that's been driven into the bottom, and, and uh, data loggers are, are attached to that to, um, uh, you know, it provides a, a fairly simple, commonly available mounting stake. You just got to make sure there's no boats coming through there. And um, this, is, uh, this is a stake uh, in quotes. Uh, it's actually a telephone pole, as you can see. This is for uh, you know, hurricane uh, storm surge monitoring, where you just uh, and you can you know, see uh, the storm surge is pretty powerful, and uh, the water level logger is mounted inside this uh, metal uh, stilling well. Uh, obviously, this is uh, a very robust uh, deployment, but there's uh, certain cases where you uh, uh, you know you need to do that. Let's see. I just got a question here about how do you check to see if the silt has fouled the logger. Um, yeah, really the, the uh, thing to keep in mind, actually I'll, I think I do talk about this a little bit later now that I remember, but uh, you, when you, every time you pull up the logger, you want to check to see uh, uh, that the hole at the bottom of the logger, I don't, the, the picture of the logger is a few slides back, but the, the hole to the pressure sensor should be clear, and if it's not clear, you want to take a Q-tip or something to clear out that hole. And um, and if it's getting fouled, uh, you may want to get out there and offload the logger and clean it more often to keep the fouling from blocking off that hole. As long as the wa the water can get through that hole, you're you're okay. So if it's partially blocked. That's not a problem. But if it gets totally blocked, that gets to be a problem. So um, yeah, but, but back to mounting loggers on a stake. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, you got to be careful if, uh, with boat traffic. You don't want to put a stake where the boats are going to hit it. Uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, you know, in small streams and, and, and uh, stuff like that, or estuaries, there isn't the boat traffic to worry about. You can you can put a stake in if you you, know, you might want to put a flag on top if there's any chance that somebody might be going through there. Um, and I usually recommend putting a stilling well like th this one shown here. Uh, we, we, we sell this one, but you can make one out of PVC yourself, too, uh, by buying the materials at your local hardware store. And this just protects the logger. It gives you a, a place to put the logger uh, that's repeatable, so it's always going back to the same depth, which is important. We do, um, you know, some things you might want to consider if you're doing that is put a little loop on the, um, the end of the logger. You can make a loop out of uh, a zip tie, for example, and that just allows you to pull the logger out of the uh, PVC pipe more easily. just gives you something you can slip your finger into. Uh, you might also want to consider having a cable that attaches to the logger uh, just uh, in case you, you, you might drop it. Uh, uh, that gives you an added uh, uh, degree of protection. Uh, I usually recommend putting a zip tie uh, through like one of the holes in the PVC pipe and around the data logger to hold it in place. That keeps it from moving around. It just uh, gives you a more consistent measurement. And zip ties are easy enough to cut off and replace. And um, uh, let's see. In some cases, you can uh, put copper screening around the uh, the PVC pipe to help reduce the fouling as uh, as well. That uh, the copper provides a natural you know biocide uh, that discourages the growth of uh, biofouling, so you can do that. And yeah, here's a clever idea, a suggestion from one of our attendees. Thank you. Um, I use PVC glue, then just cut the PVC. It uh, makes it harder for others to get at the logger, and uh, that's uh, a real concern in a lot of cases. Uh, uh, you know, you get you you want to make sure that nobody messes with your data logger. So uh, uh, yeah, you may want to consider uh, doing that. If you're a lot of times, I find that if you're deploying loggers in those the metal wells, that uh, uh, those metal caps require one of those big pipe wrenches to take take off, so that's enough to discourage uh, you know uh, people from messing with them in uh, in those environments. But uh, in these kind of environments here, where you're mounting it on a stake, yeah, you may it, it may be worth putting it in a pipe that you have to cut apart to get the logger out. Just 
take a hacksaw out with you. <laughs> I like that. Let's see. Here's another uh, mounting method, which is to uh, mount the loggers on a rock or uh, uh, a concrete block that's going to sit on the bottom. I like this one here on the uh, uh, the left. It's a concrete slab with a couple of uh, metal loops embedded in it, and uh, uh, it makes it uh, that gives you a nice place to attach the loggers to, and it also uh, uh, Provides a, a nice smooth surface, so if a boat does happen to hit this, it's not going to be, you know, bad for you know, necessarily bad for the boat. Uh, uh, you know, we do want to be conscious of other users of the uh, the waterway. So I, I thought this was a nice way of attaching loggers. You can see this is a, some bigger loggers in this case. Um, you know, and the advantage in general of of putting uh, the loggers on a on a cement block or a concrete slab like this is you get it to the bottom. Uh, of the water so boats and stuff can go over it and not be bothered by it. And it also does a good job of um, uh, making it less visible, so uh, reduces the amount of vandalism. Uh, the challenge is, is being able to find them. Sometimes you, you need to add a cable or something that you can hook onto if it's deep water, or you just got to make really good uh, GPS coordinates, uh, line up some landmarks on shore, uh, you know, sometimes video if it's in a stream of, of where you've deployed it. Uh, sometimes you can have a, a marker uh, tape that goes up to the shore somewhere. You can grab onto that cable and follow that down to uh, where your loggers are deployed. But uh, yeah, make sure that you have a way of finding those loggers afterwards. Um, so this is a very robust way of uh, uh, of mounting a logger where you put a PVC pipe into a cement block. You, you've obviously got to uh, you know, blast a hole in the, the cement block to do that. Some people do that. Others will just attach the uh, PVC pipe to the side of a cement block. As a matter of fact, yeah, here, if you look closely at this picture, you can see the uh, PVC pipe attached to the side of that cement block strapped on. And uh, uh, here's an, just another idea is, uh, you know, you, you, you're taking these, backpacking these out into a remote location sometimes. You, you, you don't want to be carrying too much weight out with you. Is carrying the cement blocks is bad enough, but what you can, could consider is just taking cement blocks and your your loggers out there, and then to protect the the stuff from getting swept away in high uh, water flow events, you can just pile rocks around the cement blocks. The uh, you know just you know acquire them around the stream and, and and do that so you're not having to carry them out. So just just uh, another idea. So here's another uh, word and. Uh, as I mentioned, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, we're right next to Plymouth. This is a deployment over in Town Brook uh, in Plymouth uh, where they attached a, a metal stilling well to uh, uh, to a rock, a natural rock, and just had it sitting down there in the bottom and kind of had to walk out to the stream to retrieve it. But again, that was a good way to, to hold it in place. Yeah, we had some questions about the uh, the barometric pressure logger. Usually you only need to have... Uh, let's see, one uh, barometric pressure logger in the area. I think I have a bullet about that. Yeah, here we go. Uh, it needs to be, uh, we usually recommend within 10 miles of the logger is good enough. Uh, the barometric pressure, you know, within a region ch tends to change together within that kind of uh, radius. Uh, and one of the things you want to keep in mind when you're mounting the barometric pressure logger is uh, Temperature changes can affect your, your measurement accuracy with a pressure sensor. So we recommend uh, putting the barometric pressure logger in uh, an environment where it's not going to see extreme temperature changes. So putting it in a well like this is nice because the ground acts as a uh, as kind of an insulator around it, and it keeps your temperature fairly uh, you know stable. So that's a good environment. If you're going to put it outside of a well, that's that's fine too, but make sure you're not putting it in direct sun. You want to put it in a uh, you know in a shaded location that's always going to be shaded or you can you know you could put it in a radiation shield to, you know to create uh, uh, shade for it or you know do do something so it's not direct sun. Uh, uh, because that could affect your your measurement uh, accuracy especially when the, the times when it's just heating up due to the sun.
And uh, in terms of uh, barometric pressure compensation, it's easiest to use data from another Hobo water level logger, either a U20 or a U20L, uh, or a Hobo weather station with a barometric pressure sensor. But I did want to mention that you could import data from a nearby weather station as well, uh, and even if it's a different brand of weather station or water level logger, uh, we have uh, an import capability in our, our barometric compensation assistant that allows you to import that other data, so you can use that. Let's see. So next, so those are some typical mounting methods. You probably have some of your own favorites that you've come up with. Uh, I've never ceased to amaze me the uh, creativity that uh, uh, our users have. But let's talk a little bit about um, some uh, th things related to preparing uh, for deployment before you go out. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk a little bit about accuracy. And this does uh, relate to your deployment. Um, so stick with me as I go through this. Uh, uh, typically, vendors speak in terms of typical accuracy and maximum error. Uh, typical accuracy is the number we usually lead with, just because in most cases that's what you're going to see. But it, you know the measurement error could be as bad as the maximum error. Uh, but there's several factors that uh, that affect your accuracy, so you got to keep these in mind. And, and so you want to, for the best accuracy, you want to ma you know manage all of these. Uh, first is you need an accurate uh, water level measurement. So make sure that uh, you get an accurate water level measurement as you deploy the loggers, because that's what all the readings are adjusted to from that point. So your your accuracy is only as good as that initial measurement. Uh, uh, know your water density, because that does affect your uh, uh, the uh, the calculation from water uh, the pressure to uh, water depth. Uh, make sure you have accurate uh, barometric pressure data and try to minimize changing temperatures. Don't take your water level logger from a hot truck and put it right into the water and take your calibration reading right then. That sudden change could lead to uh, uh, you know, a, a reference measurement error. So you know, be conscious of that. Um, the raw pressure sensor accuracy is what you use if you don't take a reference level measurement. But if you take a reference level measurement, that basically calibrates out any drift in that raw pressure sensor since uh, you know its original factory calibration. So we recommend always taking a, a reference level measurement. And when you're looking at uh, water level loggers, uh, be sure to make sure that it's the loggers you're using have a good temperature compensation uh, if you're going to be using them in places where there's uh, changing temperatures, such as surface waters. Uh, that temperature compensation is an important factor in the overall accuracy. So here's just a little checklist uh, of um, things to do before uh, deploying water level loggers. Make sure your software is up to date. Uh, make sure that the computer clock is correct because that time is what's going to be used to uh, to set the time for your logger. So make sure that that's correct and for the right time zone. Uh, uh, we'll talk about launching loggers on the next slide. Uh, if you're using the waterproof shuttle, you want to make sure that that's uh, also up to snuff. Uh, make sure the batteries are, are less than a year old. Make sure that it has the latest firmware. Uh, that, that's important, especially uh, uh, for the U20L logger. It has to have the latest 3.20 version of the software. Uh, make sure that the shuttle's been launched because that's what uh, sets the clock and uh, and sets the you know into the right operating mode. So. Make sure all those things are set. And if you're going to be deploying in salt water of unknown salinity, you know, um, uh, especially in an estuary environment, you probably want to plan on taking a salinity meter into the field to, to record what the density or the salinity of that water is. And then you can use that to calculate your density afterwards. So as I mentioned, I was going to talk a little bit about launching loggers. Um, just a couple things. Make sure the batteries are good in the loggers before you deploy them, and our software will display that. You can see the little green battery there. This battery was good. And um, make sure that you always record the temperature channel in the logger. That's required for temperature compensation. So you know, we, we shouldn't even make that optional. That's really required. And then here's a little time-saving tip that uh, a lot of uh, our users don't know about is if you're going to be launching a bunch of loggers at once, you can 
use uh, this preference here, which is to uh, use the previous launch, the contents of the previous launch, to fill the launch window on your next logger. So if you're launching uh, you know, five water level loggers together, uh, you set up the, the logging interval and the start time for the first logger, and then that will automatically get copied over to the next water level logger that you plug into the base station and the, and the software. So that way you, you're insured of getting the same logging rate and the same start time on each one of those loggers. Just, it's a nice way of ensuring consistent results and uh, saving you some time. Let's see, field deployment. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about deployment data retrieval. Again, this is kind of a checklist of things to, to, to keep in mind as you're deploying loggers. Uh, be careful lowering the logger into the water to avoid sensor shock. Even though it's a durable sensor, you still don't want to you know, drop it down in. Uh, and as I mentioned, you always want to take a reference level measurement at the beginning of the deployment. I usually recommend waiting a little bit of time, and especially if the logger is undergoing a big temperature change. You want to allow it time to get to uh, the temperature of the water in the well, and be sure to record the you know the, the time of that reference water level measurement. Uh, you know, check the uh, salinity of the water. You know, it, 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 a lot of it depends on how much accuracy you're looking for. That uh, if you're looking for that uh, fraction of a percent accuracy, that's when the, the density becomes uh, important. Uh, if you don't have a meter with you, you can always bring a sample of water back to the lab with you. Let's see. At the end of each deployment period. Uh, at the end of the deployment, I also recommend taking another reference measurement. You can use that to check uh, your data afterwards. This is kind of a, you know, I, I, I'm a strong believer in redundancy, just to be sure. And uh, this is also when you check your logger for any signs of fouling. Um, if uh, you want, need to clean the logger, uh, you know, you'll make sure that hole's clear, like a Q-tip, or uh, sometimes you can, you know, soak it in some... Um, vinegar or something, if it's a uh, mineral deposit, that takes a while, obviously. Uh, the, yeah, you want to try to keep that, that area you know, the, around the pressure sensor clear. So now I want to talk a little bit about using the uh, barometric compensation assistant. And let me just kind of walk you through this. You, and this gives you a sense for uh, the effect of water density. You can see fresh water, it's got a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Salt water has a density of uh, 1,025 kilograms uh, per meter cubed. So you can see there's basically a, a 2.5% uh, difference there. So that's, that gives you a sense for whether it's going to be important in your application or not. Uh, we do have a choice for brackish water, which is kind of you know, halfway in between, or you can input uh, your own water density if you um, uh, if you've measured the salinity, then you convert that salinity to uh, the appropriate density. Uh, this is where you enter in the reference water level. Uh, in most cases, you want to use that. You just enter in that. That's either from, that could be from the top of the well down to the water level. It can be uh, a reading from a staff gauge. It really depends upon what you're using as your reference. And in most cases, uh, you'll want to use a barometric pressure data file. So this is a uh, this could be, as I mentioned before, a Hobo water level logger, or it could be, uh, you know, uh, from a weather station that's nearby. There's, you know, but you, it does make a difference. That that's really important. Uh, and then you can uh, name the series. And if this was the real software, you just click that and create the new data series. But in this case, <laughs> it's not the real software. I'm just showing you a screenshot. And some things to do to check the, your accuracy. I, uh, again, I like double checking that things are okay. Uh, what, uh, one of the things I like to do is to check that the loggers reach temperature stability. I'll show you a picture of that on a screenshot next. And then I li also like running the data once with a starting reference measurement and once again with the ending reference measurement and compare the two data series, make sure they're close. Uh, it, if, if they're different, it could be because of drift. 
usually though it's usually because one of the reference readings was off and you'll have to decide which one was the, the most accurate uh, reference reading and um, so here's the uh, uh, here's a plot of the data and you can see this is just where you check that the loggers reach temperature stability so you can see this I've just zoomed in on the data here so this is uh, water temperature dropping down pretty dramatically and here you can see it's you know at this point it's you know pretty much at the at a stable temperature and so you could use this as your uh, this point as your uh, uh, reference water level and you can see if you chose the point before that the temperature really wasn't stable at that point so that would not have been a good choice for your reference water level measure you're better off using this next one let me just touch real briefly on a couple other features of Hobelware then I'll get to questions um, uh, I can I can see some good questions have been coming in. Um, one of the features of the Hobelware software is we have something called Save Project. Uh, and the nice thing about this in the context of water level loggers is after you've you've processed the data, you've brought in your pressure and temperature data, you know, uh, from the the uh, logger, you've processed it with the barometric pressure uh, data assistant and converted it to water level. You can then save that data file as water level data and um, uh, it, and uh, just a lot easier to work with that data after that point uh, in the, as a project file. Uh, we also have the ability to crop the data series, and this is useful if uh, your your logger was sitting in a truck before you deployed it, and you don't want to, you know, have that data in there confusing things. You can uh, say, you know, basically crop off the data before this point and uh, save and then resave the file. And we also have the ability to merge project files. So you can create a project file and then add to it uh, with uh, additional data to, uh, you know, as you, as you get data from successive deployments. And then you can save that merged data file uh, all together. So you can build up a, um, uh, you know, a complete history over several deployments in one data file. You know, and a lot of folks, you know, will ex export it to Excel or another program and do that as well. But you, you can do that in Hoboware if you want. So, um, yeah, looks like uh, we're to the uh, question and answer portion of the uh, the program, and and uh, I've got about eight or so minutes left. So let me kind of go over here and look. I've been uh, glossing over them, but I've been seeing they've been coming in. So let's see what we've got. Uh, See, I'm just looking for some common ones uh, because we do have quite a few. Let's see. Yeah, um, we have a question here about uh, managing water density effects in uh, est estuary conditions. Um, yeah, that is challenging because in an estuary, your salinity is changing, and and sometimes you just have to pick kind of a medium point. Uh, you know, we have that checkoff box uh, back here uh, where you can, you know, I'll see if I go back to it, where you can just select brackish water, and that's a kind of a, it's a decent compromise, and that may be accurate enough for estuary conditions. If you really want to get uh, precise about it, you could actually deploy a uh, salinity logger in, in uh, in parallel with the water level logger, and we do have users that are doing that, and then you can use that salinity uh, data to come up with density over time and use that to adjust your water level do uh, data. But right now our software doesn't do that, so you kind of have to do that in post-processing on your own afterwards. It gets to be complicated, but uh, uh, if you're looking for the, the highest precision, you, you can do that, and I would recommend that. And let's see. Oh, there's a question here about using the multiple logger method. Does it still allow you to create a name for each logger? Um, yeah, I think that's referring to the multiple launch uh, feature. And yeah, you can add in a different name for each logger. I think it automatically, there's another preference where you can set up what the default name is for each logger so that you can, I think you can have the serial number embedded in that. Ch you know, check me on that. but. So there's certain defaults that allow you to, to automatically have a different name for each logger. Uh, but you can also, as you go into the launching each logger, you could even key in another 
uh, unique description for each logger. So yeah, if you want to enter like you know the deployment site into each logger, you can do that, and that's important for being able to track the data afterwards. Uh, let's see. There's a question in here: If no barometric data is available, to what extent will the results be uh, affected? The um, yeah, you can see six inches of variation pretty easily from uh, barometric pressure changes. So if you're just deploying over a, a short period of time, you know, like over a day, you're not going to see, you know, that dramatic uh, barometric uh, changes in most cases. So your, your data is probably okay. Like a, if you're doing like a pump down test, for example, you, you you probably don't need a barometric pressure data file. But if you're going to be deploying over a length of time, you really want to have uh, barometric pressure data. And there is, uh, I know Noah, I think, I think it's Noah, um, I have to, uh, maybe I'll have to follow up with you on this. There are sites where you can get data from nearby weather stations, including uh, uh, you know, barometric pressure data, and you can import that and use that to correct for the barometric pressure changes during your uh, deployment. So uh, sometimes you might have to pay for that data as a nominal charge for it, but uh, at least that data is available, so that will, uh, you know, you can recover that if need be. Let's see, there's a question here. Uh, does the barometric logger need to be at a particular elevation in comparison to the other loggers? It turns out, because of the way the math works out, that the elevation of the barometric pressure logger versus the other loggers really doesn't matter. It just gets, it gets normalized out. As long as the barometric logger is staying at the same elevation during your deployment and your, your other you know, loggers in the water are staying at the same location, uh, the, the, uh, the elevation difference doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, for a lot of our testing, we have a barometric pressure logger that's at uh, our building and onset, which is, I don't know, uh, 60 feet above sea level. And we'll be deploying, uh, our, uh, using that to correct data for water level loggers that are at, at sea level. And again, it, it, the math cancels that out. So the elevation differences don't matter. Let's see. This question about best way to convert your water level measurements to MASL. Uh, I think that's uh, mean average sea level or something like that. I'm not so good with my acronyms, but um, yeah, that's um, that's one of the tricky things about water level logger deployments is you do. Uh, you need to do the math to uh, uh, to to get your reference readings converted to whatever your reference point is, and and probably the most common reference point is going to be uh, looking at your data relative to uh, to sea level. That's that's uh, so if it's a well application, a lot of times the top of that well is uh, surveyed into um, uh, you know, surveyed relative to mean sea level, and uh, that becomes your reference point. Then you have to measure down from the top of that well to the water level, and that becomes your, you know, your 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 depth down. So you subtract that distance down to the water from the height of the well relative to sea level, and that gives you your, your starting reference point. But uh, yeah, you, a lot of this kind of stuff, I like to draw pictures. Uh, it just helps keep me from getting confused and make sure that uh, I don't switch the signs uh, as I'm entering in reference water levels. So uh, draw pictures, that's <laughs> my advice. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, here's a question. If your initial deployment is above water, do you enter zero for the reference? Um, yeah, yeah. Like the hurricane deployments, um, you, where you're deploying the water level logger and it's in air at the time, that is your that is your zero uh, re reference because what will happen is the water comes up uh, and reaches the um, uh, water level logger. I guess this applies in uh, wetlands applications too. As the water comes up to meet the uh, sensor, as soon as it, is, it hits the sensor, that's zero. And then any changes above that uh, will be, you know, your your water level or your your um, above that sensor. So, yes, if if you're deploying it in air to start with, uh, you enter zero, enter zero as your reference water level. Let's see. 
Oh, here's a uh, here's some uh, an input from one of uh, our attendees. Uh, you can visit www.usa uh, dot com for current barometric pressure readings. So if you're looking for uh, you know some uh, current barometric pressure, maybe histories there of, uh, as well. That's a uh, a source. So USA AirNet or US AirNet. That's probably what it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> so thanks for that, Mark. Um, yeah. So. Let's see if I can pick out a couple more here. Some of these are, are just a little bit more detailed. I'm going to have to do a little more research to give you a good answer. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I'll follow up with you on those. And so, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that one is. So I'm going to follow up. I think what I'm going to do, I think we've covered a good number of these questions. Yeah. So sorry, I'm just kind of reading through these as, uh, uh, here. A question about can you remove the nose cone for cleaning the transducer face? No, the nose cone is actually, especially with the new U20L logger, the, uh, the nose cone's all molded into the, to the housing. So you really just can access it from the outside, which you can see for cleaning it. Let's see. I think this is. I think we've gone through most of the uh, most of the questions I can answer at this time. And uh, like I said, I will follow. I'll go through them to see which ones I missed, and I will follow up afterwards. And I'm just kind of going through fast forward. I did want to uh, leave you with uh, this uh, our contact information because you know certainly we've addressed some of your questions here today. But uh, if you've got questions at any time. Please do not hesitate to give us a call at 1-800-LOGGERS or uh, uh, write an email to one of our application specialists or tech support. And uh, I also want to just point out our, our website, which is just a, a wealth of uh, technical information. Of course, it's got all the product specs and pricing uh, there, but it's also got a lot of white papers and interesting application stories and tips and recordings of other webinars, uh, software demos, it's just a wealth of resources there at our, at our website. So please use that as a resource. We, we put that out there uh, for you to use. So at this point, I want to say uh, thanks for attending. It's been a pleasure having you uh, today. And hopefully uh, I've been able to, to answer some of your questions and provide you some, uh, some information. So as I mentioned before, there is going to be a survey when I sign off. Uh, so hopefully you take a couple moments to give us your feedback. And uh, thanks again for attending.